Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reina uh, Leibrand, Tsimitakopoulos. So I'm Afrikaans, but I married a Greek, so which is why the name is so weird. Um, today I'm going to talk about Direct Access's journey to event-driven microservices. So who is Direct Access? Uh, we're a member of the First Rand Group, so we're in the same stable as organizations like FNB, West Bank, uh, Motor Vantage is in there, Ash Burton. So there's quite a few of us in the First Rand Group. We are one of the smaller business units. We've been around for about 25 years, and last year we got wholly sort of bought out by First Rand. Um, we are the largest non-bank unsecured credit provider in South Africa by outstanding balance. So the, <clears throat> our company economist told me how to say it just like that, because it's very accurate. Um, so at the, at the end of uh, June last year, we had lent for a year to date, we had lent out 9.2 billion rand to normally just the consumer, the consumer lending market, and we process uh, credit bureau and data on about 23 million credit actors South Africans all the time. We are a Microsoft IT shop, so we do a lot of C-sharp. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about event-driven microservices using C-sharp, and you thought it couldn't be done. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> don't worry, it's possible, I'll, I'll tell you how. Um, every month we process about 113,000 loan applications, and of those we actually hand out about 19,000 loans a month. And we also have 92,000 insurance policies on book. So we've been on a fairly long journey now. We used to have a big monolith, like a huge monolith that sat right in the middle of our architecture. So between uh, 2017 and 2018, we went on a bit of a refactoring journey because we were finding it increasingly difficult to deploy. And it's funny, like all the things I've heard today, it, it really spoke to me because we were in this problem space where every time we tried to deploy, everybody had to get involved. So it was at that point where microservices felt like the next right step for us, just to decouple the deployment pipelines a little bit and get a bit of sort of selective scalability going. But I'm not going to talk about the stuff we did in 2017 and 2018, because that's a whole other talk all by itself. Um, I am going to talk about the work we did in 2019, which was moving from sort of a restful microservices-based architecture that was very focused around sort of... Um, single source the truth, bounded context, domain-driven design, how we move the next step to event-driven microservices using Kafka. Um, what we are looking at at the moment, having sort of implemented Kafka pipelines, is we are looking to get the data scientist teams on board using these Ka Kafka pipelines a bit more interactively. But I'm not gonna talk about that either. So today, we're just focusing on event-driven microservices, and it's about getting the development and the data teams working closer together using tools like Kafka. Okay, so this is our IT architecture, this is the stats. Uh, we're about 160 people in our IT department. We have 18 service teams. Now, these service teams are multifunctional teams. They, they take care of either a domain or a bounded context, and sometimes they take care of several bounded contexts. In total, we've got about 110 bounded contexts, because we went through an exercise a while ago to identify all the bits we had lying around. It's about 15 major domains we also have. Uh, we also have seven major COTS products. That's not COTS. <laughs> products, I can have because it's, it's a commercial off-the-shelf software. Uh, so they're basically just very expensive tools that we've bought over time. Um, they, they do add value, mostly, um, but they, yeah, they, they take a fair amount of effort to maintain sometimes. We also have 200 deployment packages that we run. So we've got a CICD pipeline. It consists of Jenkins and Octopus. And uh, we found that it was a huge help in our journey from 2017 to 2018 to get our DevOps pipelines really like embedded and get everything automated, because we would never have gotten to where we are today without that. Uh, just to mention, we also have 10 project managers and 10 BAs, because we also have a project office in our organization. So we are a financial services organization, so we still do long-running projects, and mostly these BAs and project managers help coordinate long-running projects that go over several services teams. So this is our obligatory uh, tooling slide everybody has to have. So you can see the seven major cost products are in there. So we use Sitecore for our digital platform. We've got Avaya for our contact center platform. Uh, Hortonworks, which I think is now bought by Cloudera, does our data platform bits, so Kafka and the like, and also uh, Hadoop and all of that. We have SAS, quite a bit of SAS. Uh, there's FICO Blaze, which does our rules engines. So that will come in, that's quite an important piece for us, because that lives in the credit risk space, where you need to have your rules very clear as to what's happening in there. Um, what are the other products we have? Mm, oh, yeah, we have Adobe Campaign. It's another big one we have as well. So you see, it's a fair, it's a fair tech stack. We do C-sharp microservices, 
their .NET Core microservices. So our teams, 18 teams I spoke, I think it's 19 teams nowadays. They're a mix of COTS teams, taking care of the big box products, and c -sharp based microservices as well. Um, our data teams also use tools like Scala, Python, Java, and whatever. So we're not really that technology um, stringent. We basically use whatever is necessary for the job, but mainly if you're just gonna build an, uh, like a new piece of greenfield technology, you're generally doing it with .NET Core. And we're trying to build it that it's container ready. And I'll explain why I say container ready. So, beginning of 2019, we'd gone on a journey, we got RESTful microservices, we've built bounded context teams, so we were feeling good about that. So we had a customer team, we've got a credit risk team, we've got a digital marketing team, so everybody's kind of si sitting in their own spaces, and we th we're feeling pretty good about ourselves, and we say that they're producing a single source of the truth, and they're exposing a single source of truth through RESTful microservices. Um, people are only allowed to access these microservice teams' data uh, databases through the RESTful APIs. And of course our DevOps and CIC pipeline was coming along quite nicely. So, IT's been transformed, architecture can have holiday, <laughs> all is well, we can just go home now. Except, what we realized was, <laughs> in fact, when we thought we transformed the dev department and we could just stop there, there was in fact a whole world of the data teams that still hadn't come along on sort of a domain-driven design journey, which is why I found the previous talk so interesting because you actually have to transform the whole IT department. You can't just transform a piece of it and then say, job done. So what we were finding is, where we thought we had domain teams or bounded context teams in the dev department, we actually were finding in the data teams, duplicate teams. So where we had a party or customer team in the dev department, we actually had teams processing customer data also in the data space. And that was across the board, all our big areas, credit, uh, credit risk, direct marketing, digital marketing, processing of credit bureau data, all of them had almost duplicate teams in the data teams, and they were processing big data pipelines and spitting out another single source of the truth. So now we had two single sources of the truth. Why so much duplication? Why, why? So there was a weird space, and I'm not gonna call it big data because it's not petabytes of data. It's kind of big-ish data. It's just uncomfortable enough that you don't like pushing it through RESTful, RESTful APIs. It's kind of, we need to process millions of records and you get a file landed from outside. Now what I didn't mention in my previous sort of slide, we're a platform business. So we don't just process direct access personal loans. We actually also run West Bank's personal loans on top of our systems, and we run Sunlum's personal loans on top of our systems. And we started picking up more F&B's back office functions as well. So we need to be quite generic and quite high performance in order to provide these different brands with a sort of a very personalized experience. And we get a lot of files in from these third parties, and then these millions of rows need to be processed. So whose job was it? Well, if you look at what the dev teams were doing, so you've got your dev teams. They, sorry, I had to use free photos that have no attribution and all of that, so you get what you get for the photos sometimes. <laughs> sorry, it's insulting to all. At least it's equal insulting. <laughs> um, so what we found with the dev teams was they were producing a single source of the truth using a very domains and bounded context focus approach, and they were having the microservices databases protected from the outside world, and that nobody could touch it. And that was all good and well, but then you look at what the data teams were doing, and they were merely taking these very isolated microservices databases, and they're pulling them all together, and they were mushing them, and they were creating things called data products, or data marts, or data lakes. And it's all about pulling things together and making combined data sets. And the systems that they were producing in the, in the dev teams, they're very transactional systems. So when a customer comes to one of our front doors, if they come to our call center, if they come to our digital platform, then it's very often an on-demand calculation that needs to be done. So it's on-demand calculation, it's orchestrated. So at the point that the customer arrives, the piece of code has to run around finding more data, doing a calculation, and responding very quickly in a couple of milliseconds to the customer. Whereas in our back office systems, the more batch-based systems, it was a more choreographed process. So data would come streaming in from all over the world in files, or we'd be ETLing um, data uh, bases out of the transactional space. So this data was just streaming in in a very sort of ad hoc, eventually consistent way, getting to the data teams, and they were in processing, running rules on this data, and spitting out new, new information, new variables. So there were two types of departments we had, and they'd figured out two ways to proce process bulk data sets. On the one hand, you had the dev team. Some, some of our dev teams did it this way. So they would receive a file, 
this file would have, let's say, a million customer records that need to be processed. They would load this file into a SQL table, fire up an orchestration agent like a Windows service that would then one by one read the people that need to be processed, pull data in from multiple RESTful web services, do a calculation, spit it back out into a SQL table. And this SQL table would get replicated everywhere or ETLed everywhere to whoever needed it. Now, we didn't really like this. It felt dirty and disgusting because it, you can really only use this in an off-peak way, and I'll explain later why, but mainly because it causes a RESTful services spike in our world. So we don't really have um, hmm, cattle. We have pets. Our servers are named servers. I would love to get to a world where we have cattle and we just spin up and spin down. It's all elastic. But we have very precious pets that we sort of baby and pamper and, and put in a nice doggy bed at night. So we all know the names of the servers. And somebody says, server one is going down. Everybody like, ah, runs around. My god, we're all, all going to die. So that's a world of pets we live in at the moment. Maybe we'll get to elastic servers one day in the future. So the problem with that is when you spike on a server and you haven't got elastic capacity, it actually, what happens is this call center just slows down. And the digital platform just slows down. So you don't want to be doing this during the day. So you stop doing this processing, um, calculation processing after hours. And of course, we didn't like the fact that the SQL output was just being ETL'd everywhere. It's not a very good way to manage data. Now in our data teams, sometimes BI teams, they figured out another way of processing bulk data sets. So a very similar style, they'd get a big file. They say they would get 23 million credit access Africans from the credit bureau. They'd pile it into a SQL table. They'd get an orchestration agent that runs in the Hadoop ecosystem very often. Mostly they were doing Hadoop. They'd get more data from everywhere. And sometimes these data sets would take days, like a week, to eventually ETL its way into the Hadoop ecosystem. And they kick off this huge batch, probably overnight or once a month. And it would run and run and run and then spit out, boom, like a big block of data at the end. And then this data would then just get ETL'd all over the show, whoever needed it. Now, we didn't really like this approach either. Again, it's mainly after hours. We do a lot of ETL's, or we used to do a lot of ETL's to get the data moved around. So it was an after hours uses only. When we looked at trying to recruit more Hadoop people or train more people to do Hadoop, there was a surprising lack of um, enthusiasm to become Hadoop ecosystem specialists in the dev space. Um, and also, they're not that, you don't find that many people who are Hadoop experts in Cape Town. And again, we didn't like the fact that the SQL output was being replicated like everywhere. So surely we can do better than this. We're trying to figure out a better way, because we were getting more and more and more files, and as we took on more work and more joint ventures with other organizations, we were just going to be getting more data, and we needed to handle it in a more structured way. So what is really for us at that stage, beginning of 2019, the best way to process huge volumes, well, huge-ish volumes, millions of records all the time? To keep things interesting, we're a financial services organization. So we have a very complex regulatory and compliance environment. So if we do want to bring new tooling into our environment, it can take several months, if not years, to get a new piece of tech approved for use. So at that stage, we, I say no cloud. We had very little cloud usage and no containers. And in fact, if we'd waited for containers, we're now 2020, we still don't use containers. It's been a three-year battle so far. We'll get them one day. So I couldn't just spin up a bunch of containers in the cloud and. <laughs> Bob's your uncle, we're done. So we didn't have that option. So we had to come up with another plan. So what could we do? So we started asking ourselves, do we still need batches? Like these batches are a real pest. Like can we not just not get rid of batches? Why are we still doing this? It's the year 2019. And if you're going to be sharing millions of rows of data, is, is RESTful web services and SQL Server ETL really the best way to do this? Like it doesn't feel very good. We just felt dirty. So you don't want to live in a world where you feel dirty all the time and wrong. So luckily, we had a tool called Apache Kafka. Uh, because we had the Hortonworks stack and we were using um, really the Hadoop processing pipelines, we were using Kafka to get data into Hadoop. So we did a bit of reading and we realized, ah, we could actually take Apache Kafka, put it in the middle of our architecture. Pretty much all of our systems are able to publish to Kafka or subscribe from Kafka. And it would be very, very simple to just use that as a one-stop shop for all our data needs, especially when we wanted to get bulk data events. So in a way, we could actually use Apache Kafka as a kind of a data like API or an API gateway for bulk data, not for RESTful web services, just for bulk data, to share that with the organization, rather than just ETLing data all over the show. And also, the nice thing about it, you've got schemas, so you can treat it as a form of API. The nice part about it, because we had dev teams and we have data teams. 
it will suddenly get much easier by using Kafka to share things that were happening in the two different environments. Because the tooling tends to be very different. So we had the C-sharp teams doing .NET Core and using all kinds of open source tools, whereas in the, in the more data services teams or BI teams, it's still very sort of SQL, SQL server based, sometimes a bit of a dupe, Scala, Python. So the tooling is quite different and it's very database focused in the data space rather than application focused in the dev space. But luckily, there's lots of different ways to share data using Kafka. So of course, if you're doing a microservice in .NET or if you've got a COTS tool in Java, it's really simple to publish and subscribe to Kafka. It's, oh, it's, there's so many libraries out there, it's not even an issue. And if you are in the database world, we found that there was tools called CDC, so Change Data Capture. So I, I feel uncomfortable about CDC, but it's an option when there's no other way of getting the data out. And we were actually using CDC to get data out of Mongo databases already. So you're basically hooking into the op log or the change log of a database. And as it changes, you're streaming the changes out of Kafka and you get a lot of different tools that you can do it. It's not awesome and you get really raw data and you're not actually getting a domain event by doing this, but it's a, it's a second prize in case you can't get properly formed domain events out of your applications. Um, we also realized the data teams were not gonna start learning C Sharp anytime soon and that they like using tools like SSIS. So we found a tool called NiFi that comes out of the Hortonworks stack. And it's a little bit like SSIS. It actually allows you to do orchestration so you can drag and drop so it's a no code platform. And you can literally drag and drop and say, give me data from this database, push it to that Kafka topic, pull it from a Kafka topic, put it in the database. So it's a bit like SSIS on steroids, actually. And it was awesome. So now we had a lot of tools that we could share in the IT department. And we could start pushing data, blocks of data between the various teams to get a bit more collaboration going on. So this is kind of the pattern we end up settling on. So again, we get files from all over the show. So instead of ETLing this file everywhere, we would immediately, upon receiving a file, push it into a Kafka topic, for usage everywhere, and then that topic would then serve as a single source of truth for that data, and you could only get that data from that topic. Again, we have an orchestration agent. In this case, something like a Windows service would be listening. So, and to see, okay, now the data's arrived, and it could then start sourcing alternative data sources that it needed for its rules processing from other topics. So, we're calling it event-driven microservices. I'm not calling it stream processing or streaming analytics just yet, because what we're doing, once we pull the data out of the topics, is we're actually storing it in event source database tables in SQL Server. Again, <laughs> you didn't know it could be done, event sourcing SQL Server. So we're doing it and it works quite well. So we pull the data out of Kafka, we store it in event source database tables in SQL Server. We then run a calculation over these data sets we've received. We save the output into another database table and then another process will pick up this data we've created, the new knowledge we've created and start sharing that to the rest of the world via a Kafka topic. And again, we are treating our Kafka topics as forms of um, data APIs, so that you can only get the data from these APIs. We quite liked it. We kind of have a hexagonal architecture of a sort in that we use our rules engine quite a bit. So our, our uh, rules are being encapsulated in a tool called Blaze. So it's a tool from FICO. So you'd literally code up your business rules once in your rules engine. Now you can deploy these rules absolutely anywhere. You can deploy the rules in a, in a, in a Hadoop batch, you can deploy it in a RESTful web service, you deploy it in a Windows service, wherever you like, you've got the same rules, and all that changes is how you use the rules. And of course, if you've got a shared database within your particular bounded context, you've got the data coming in either from a transactional system or from a streaming system. So it keeps it nice and cohesive. So now you can really enforce this bounded context by using multiple different tools and the same business logic that's just shared in different deployment pipelines, basically. Um, we liked it, it's a very predictable way of running, it reduces the spikes, it just keeps running until it's done. And it doesn't reuse really the rest of the web services that the um, digital platform and the context in the platform relies on. Um, and of course, the topics can be reused. So we've got a publish subscribe pattern. So once you publish a single source of the truth on your topic, anybody else who needs that kind of data can come there and get the data. And you can put contracts on these topics. So it almost combines the best of rest of the web services. We have a contract and a single point of entry with the benefits of doing SQL application, we have big bulk sharing of data. So it's a nice amalgamation and it keeps your architecture actually very clean and tidy. Oh, and sorry, I just, I felt to mention, the data guys call this Kappa architecture. Yeah, if they like calling Kappa architecture, who am I to complain? But it's very similar. So we've been using a lot of the thinking around Kappa architecture and event driven microservices, and we are heading towards the future to do sort of streaming analytics as well one day in the future. So we quite liked these ideas we come up with. We've drawn some nice diagrams on a board. 
it was a good architectural fit for us in 2019. There were multiple use cases that could benefit from putting Kafka right in the middle of our architecture and using it as a one-stop data sharing sort of area. Uh, the single source of truth was very important to us. We'd just gone through years and years of enforcing domain-driven design principles and binary context and making these multifunctional binary context teams. So having the single source of truth that is enforced via the use of standard APIs was very attractive to us. Target optimization, that's an interesting one. So we said that our Kafka platform is going to be highly available, so it's never allowed to go down. So we've got, I know I keep hearing about this cheap storage thing. I, I'm yet to see cheap storage. We, we live in a world of tier one storage. Like everything is a pet and it's all got tier one storage. So one day I'll find cheap storage. So we had to go get very expensive storage and very expensive servers and put on three huge boxes and like make sure they are like touch wood, never gonna go fall over. And that's our centralized Kafka data sharing platform. And what can happen now is now we can have cheap consumers of this very expensive data sharing platform. So you can now have a pet, a single server, publishing to Kafka and subscribing from Kafka. And if it died, so what? Because we've told everybody it's eventually consistent. If your server goes down for like an hour or two hours and you're okay with the paradigm of eventual consistency, it shouldn't be an issue. So now we can spend money only where it's needed. So I don't have to spend, make everything highly available. Because that's really expensive, especially when you live in a world of everything is tier one storage, everything is like expensive. So you kind of want to see where, what, in the real world, what actually has to never die and what can be allowed to die selectively, given that your time, like, you've got SLAs. It can die, but it's got to come back up in like three hours, four hours, eight hours. You know, you've got SLAs on your servers. Uh, FRG integration, first round group integration. So because we've now joined the greater first round group, we are now in the process of integrating more with West Bank, FNB, on, and, and other business units. So a nice way for us to share data, rather than doing file sharing, is now to plug our Kafka cluster into the greater group Kafka cluster. And the group has got a huge Kafka cluster. It's like a monster thing. So we've got a tiny little three server cluster compared to them, but it's a nice way of getting and sharing data and keeping it fairly consistent. And of course, customer experience improves. So rather than running batches every 24 hours, a customer gives you data, and 24 hours later, the calculation reflects, we can now literally intraday be running uh, processes and giving the customers the best marketing experience, the best digital experience, the best credit risk experience. So the data is always as fresh as we can get it because it's constantly running. Well, that sounds awesome. Where do I pay? That's what my boss said. <laughs> well, I really actually fought hard. So eventually I got someone to pay for the server and the business was very excited about it and we thought that there was great possibilities in there. <sighs> then we had to start doing the work. So this was the whole sales process we went down. So now we have to actually implement this whole dream we had sold to people. So selling the dream, that's very important. And in a big organization, they call it change management, but it's actually selling the dream, like getting people excited about wanting to use Kafka, about wanting to proactively push their data out onto this new cluster we've got. And I had to go around explaining to the business what the business benefits were gonna be. We had to get product owners on board, because they would have to prioritize the work to do this. We had to get all the technical leads to understand why, why are we bothering to do this? Like, what's the point? So it was a huge sales journey where it's like constantly standing up and selling and selling and getting people excited about it. So don't ever underestimate change management because you, you need the people in your idea department to go with you on this journey and to be so sort of bought into what we're trying to achieve and kind of see where the pain points are that you're trying to relieve. Um, infrastructure, so we used to sit on, well, we still do have a, a Hortonworks data platform a cluster but that was focused more on doing Hadoop processing. So then we had to build a HDF cluster, a Hortonworks data flow cluster, to try to get a more focused um, integration. So it's focused around NiFi and Kafka, the HDF cluster. So it's a focus on sharing data rather than processing batches. So we had to get that set up and working and make sure it's quite stable. Um, support. So like I said, we, had a big, we have a big data team, but they were focused on Hadoop processing. So we had to do a bit of upskilling there, get more people in, we were promising this Kafka cluster was never gonna go down. So now we had to have 24 seven support. So we had to make sure we had the humans, like the people who were able to do that and be able to support this cluster 24 seven. Um, we also got a support contract with an external uh, company called Autumn Leaf. So when we have really difficult problems and nobody's got time for it, we can actually rely on our, on our external service provider to assist as well. So it's quite important. You gotta assume the fact that things are gonna go wrong. Something's gonna fail and what are you gonna do? Like at least plan for what are you gonna do when it all goes to hell in the middle of the night. Um, the Kafka Rails I'll get to now, but that's around how do you get everybody to work with the platform in the same way? Because 
as much as you think you're selling the dream in the same way and everybody's understood what you've sold, when people go to use the platform, they start doing wildly different things. So you have to get people using the platform in a very consistent way, otherwise it doesn't really work so well. Uh, microservices Rails. So again, we're a C-sharp Microsoft, Microsoft shop. So it might surprise you, but C-sharp and Kafka have only recently kind of become friends and got a nice stable um, DLLs and libraries to sort of work with each other. So we went through a phase of trying, trying out different DLLs that allowed us to use C-sharp to publish and subscribe into Kafka, and eventually we've now found quite a nice stable one. Um, I was, I'm gonna name check the people on my team. So if you wanna know more about the, the Kafka libraries, there's a guy called Louis Laubscher sitting in the back there somewhere. You can go and talk to him about what version we settle on eventually. And the team lead of our big data um, Kafka team is Mark Sherwood. And you can also go talk to him if you get more detail about how we set up Hortonworks. But it, it took a fair amount of effort to get things stable enough that we could rely on it to actually start rolling things out into production. Uh, the data in the BI rails. Yeah, the data guys were not going to be up for learning C-sharp anytime soon, so we had to make sure that they could actually engage with this platform in a way that worked with their current processes. So having found this tool called NiFi and trained everybody on it, they now seem really comfortable with it, and in fact, it scares me because with great power comes great responsibility. So we are still trying to preserve a dumb pipe, <laughs> clever endpoint, so yeah, but the data in BI Rails, it, it, we, had, we had to get people on board using the tool in the way they needed to, in, in their own particular context, not forcing them to work in a way that wasn't natural to them. Security, okay. So we got Ranger. So Ranger is a tool that comes with Hortonworks, and it allows you to do Kerberos security. So we had to figure out how to get our existing Active Directory security integrating with Ranger. And that was not a thing we should have left to a week before going live <laughs> at all. So don't do that, learn from us. If you are gonna do something like embed, um, emerge, ranger, and active directory, start from day one. Like, get security embedded from day one, and don't wait until, like, you're in pre-prod to kind of think, oh, I need security. Like, do it earlier rather than later. But anyway, we got it working, and all is well, ends well, but, yeah, learn from us. Monitoring. So I said we had no, no cloud. We do have a little bit of cloud. We've got Azure App Insights. So. We just, we just publish all our events and our, and our monitoring events to Azure App Insights, and we kind of basically check, because we, we need to be very, very sure we cannot really lose data. So we'd prefer to reprocess events, so we can actually set back um, the counter on Kafka. So we can actually reprocess events rather than lose any data at all. So we had to put monitoring in place to make sure what was published onto Kafka is actually being consumed at the other end, and that not a single record was lost. So we do prefer that you reprocess things three times over, and that people must code for the fact that they can do multiple retries rather than single try only. Like there's no, you need to be, you need to be able to reprocess the data if need be. So we got the monitoring in place and we made sure it was quite interactive um, along with how we were running it. So if errors start pitching up in our topics, we can actually see the monitoring going like up, errors going up, 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 and then we fix the error and then errors go down, down, down. So it's quite nice and interactive to sort of see the fact that the errors are linked to this particular topic that went wrong switch it back on again, or switch the processing back on again, and it streams out and it goes well again. So you need, you need to be very much aware of when things go wrong, because they're all gonna go wrong. So just know about it before your business knows about it. Kafka Rails I mentioned, so how do you get the data teams and the dev teams to collaborate and use this platform that you've put in the middle of, between the two of them, to use it in a way that it makes sense to everybody? So we agreed on the event message structure. I, I like the uh, reference to cloud events, so, um, we, we, long before we even saw cloud events, we'd actually defined a header. So everybody has to use the same header to publish events onto the Kafka topics. Um, and I didn't mention events here. Oh yes, we agreed that this was gonna be an event hub. So mainly when you publish to Kafka, you need to be publishing events rather than commands. So I haven't got a slide that tells you what is an event, what is a command. Um, there's a very nice presentation that you can go find on the internet from I think it's Jonas Brunner, and it's about all of this stuff, events and commands, and I, I quite liked it. I thought it was a very insightful presentation, and I do encourage you to go and watch that. But events, something has happened in the past, publish the fact that it has happened onto your event hub. Um, in order to sort of track this, we then had topic and schema registries, so lists of topics. Metadata management is quite important. So the big problem with microservices sometimes is now your databases are hidden and they're kind of secret but your business still wants to know what data is available. So you're gonna to need to explain to them, these are the topics, these are the schemas of the topics, these are the rest of the APIs, this is the schemas of the rest of the APIs. So people need to be able to do data discovery and engage with what's available to them 
because they are going to want to do different analytics and different business problems using the data. So you need to be able to share the information with the business in a way that's easy for them to understand. We went with Jason. So I, I had a nice laugh about yeah, Jason versus Avro debate. <laughs> We've been debating Jason versus Avro probably about a year now. Eventually, we settled on Jason, mainly for the fact is this was quite a big change for us. And Avro was a new serialization technology we hadn't used before, but we were all very comfortable with Jason. So we figured, let's just go small, do things in a, an easy way. Let's not make our lives hard. Start with Jason and just figure out, get some learnings first, and then when all is well and stable, we can always start moving towards Avro. But in fact, right now, we are doing some transformations in our pipelines that go Avro to Jason and vice versa. So it's not so hard to go Avro to Jason. But um, Avro is preferred if you want to do schema management because it is a way better way of tracking your schemas. And it also has a nice schema registry that goes with it. But yeah, if you just want to kind of work with the tool you understand, and of course, JSON and um, C Sharp go quite well together. And we haven't really yet found a nice C Sharp JSON library. Um, topic and message naming. Yeah. Who knew naming was so hard? No, okay, we all knew naming was so hard. Um, no, naming is terrible. Like trying to figure out what the names of things are because you, you actually, by naming a thing, you're saying this is the domain, this is the binary context, this is the owner of the data, and only you own the data, and you actually don't own the data. So that was quite a tough process of trying to agree on a naming standard, and I still don't think we're done with the discussions around it. When we move into the greater group in terms of data sharing, we'll probably have this debate again around naming conventions. Um, I mentioned the publish subscribe pattern. So if we are using, in our world, Kafka as a form of data API, we said to everybody, you use it to publish your own truth. You only publish your truth in a generic sort of published fashion. You don't take heed of who's subscribing downstream. Having said that, sometimes subscribers do need shaped data to, to suit themselves. So we said subscribers are allowed to take data out of Kafka. They can transform the data in whichever shape or form they need it, but then only they, the downstream subscriber, can consume off of this second source of truth because we want to preserve a single source of truth. It's like a one-stop API where you get a particular kind of data. So if you are going to shape the data and push it back into Kafka, only you can consume from that, and it's not allowed for the public to consume. So you get the use of the tool, but you don't get to pollute our single source of the truth and our metadata management. Um, shape subscriber, oh yes, and we only keep data in, in uh, Kafka for seven days. And oh no, what happens to the historical data? So we also have a data lake. And the good thing about the data lake is that when we publish data into Kafka, we do in fact stream the data out of Kafka into, into whichever application needs it, but also into the data lake. Now sometimes, when we stream the data into the data lake, we actually shape the data in a way that is specific to the data lake. Because when you publish into Kafka in our world, we normally only publish the results of a calculation. So we assume that the, the, all the history of it is sitting inside the database that belongs to the binary context. So we'll, then we'll just publish the results of what we calculated. But sometimes the data lake actually needs the input variables as well, especially when you want to do further analytics. So for the data lake, sometimes we'll shape a command and we'll say, here, have the output and the rest of the input variables and the why of why we got to this answer. So it's just the data lake is a bit of an exception. The reason it's an exception, we don't keep a full history, like I said, of all data in Kafka. So now if you want to start up a new microservice, and this new microservice wants to track over three years all the data from three different other microservices. You're going to need to do an initial data take on. Where is that going to come from? It's going to come from the data lake. And thank heavens it's shaped in the same way that the Kafka topics are shaped. So you do your initial data take on out of the data lake into your new microservice and then keep it hydrated, keep it up to date out of Kafka. And that way you can spin up new services and bring them on board fairly quickly. And again, like I said, it's pets, not cattle. So this, this way of working works quite well for us. So I think we all know how events work, well, I hope so, but I just figured I'd better have the obligatory event <laughs> slide on here. So in our world, we'd have something like a loan service, and the loan service would publish an event like loan taken up event onto our event hub, or our Kafka, Apache Kafka uh, streaming platform. Then we'd have two other microservices, like a comm service and a credit risk service listening for the event. The comm service would react by sending an SMS, and the credit risk service would react by recalculating a customer's credit risk offer, the loan offer available, and republishing and publishing that event onto the event hub. And then you'd have something like a marketing service listening for this event and recalculating the, the campaigns that are linked to the customer. So it works really well. This is exactly how our business thinks. So microservices is perhaps not for everybody, and event-driven microservices perhaps are overkill in many organizations. In our environment, 
we have several very complex um, organizations and flows working together. And by using a centralized event hub, it really simplified and clarified our architecture for us and it made life so much easier because now you know. Now, now your architecture is modeling how the business actually works. So we ended up with this as our, it's very simplified architecture. I still feel guilty when I look at it. It's really simplified, but that's a gist of it. Um, in the front, we've got what I'm calling a service mesh because it's a cool word of the moment, but I, I feel I can get away with calling it a service mesh because um, we have no internal API gateway. We only have like a template service or a chassis upon which we build our c -sharp microservices. So, so it's not a standalone service mesh tool that sits on the side of our microservices. It's actually a tool that we sort of build our microservices into and then bring them alive. And then the microservices that need to know about each other talk to each other in the way they need to. And then on the back end, this, the same uh, bounded context would have um, publishing out re re RESTful microservices in the front and events on the back. So what we're going to get to probably in 2020 is doing more work around here in the feature stores and the predictive models. So who was brave enough to go first? We had a credit risk server that needed decommissioning. It was just a really old server full of SSIS jobs, and it was taking several days to process and spit out a huge volume of data. I'm not going to tell you how we did it. I have five minutes left. <laughs> but eventually, it all succeeded, which is why I'm standing on the stage, because otherwise, I wouldn't be too, I'd be too afraid to stand on stage and tell you how awesome this is. It worked really well. The business is very excited about it. Our credit risk process got re-engineered. We went from five days of processing for the credit risk output to several hours, and we can rerun it as much as we like, because we've coded it to be rerunnable. Um, it's really robust. It's, it's actually, you can pretty much do anything you like and throw anything you like at it, and it works very well with us in a kind of an ad hoc way. It's trusted because we only allow data to go one level deep. So because we say Kafka is where the data stops and you can't republish someone else's data, you know where the data came from. So if a bad data set features up, you know who it is. It's that one API and everybody can see where it came from. So it makes things so much easier to trace and data lineage becomes way easier. Uh, it's proven. We thought we'd only have to process a million records in the beginning and within two months they were like, oh no, actually you need to process three million records and it did it without even a hitch, so it's not even an issue. We can actually scale quite nicely. We just keep running longer or add more service to it. So it's not very huge, but we're actually doing it in more and more and more places. So these, these processing records actually add up over time. Uh, it's evolutionary. We'll be getting more and more data sources from first hand going forward. Reusable, supported, decoupled. It's all of those good things, but especially the, the decoupling, because we're going to be switching out some of our applications going forward. And now, because we've got a defined binary context that you can only access via RESTful web services or Kafka topics, we can now switch out these applications and plug a new one in as long as we do a translation to the APIs. So that helps us a lot. Things to consider. Mind shift change. People don't like pushing data proactively. It feels like a waste. Especially in a world of tier one storage, pushing data out proactively feels like a waste. Enforcing single source of truth, who owns the data? Yeah, that's the debate you have to have with your business. Because there are several places that could um, reasonably own a customer record for argument's sake. Streaming technologies don't always work so well. If you're in the Microsoft world, you can get there, but you need to work at it. It can get done, but you've got to actually understand the fact that it doesn't just work out of the box sometimes. Trading upskilling, don't just dump your devs or your data teams in this and say, make it work. Like, go on a journey, teach people, get them excited about it, show them what you're trying to achieve. Uh, materialized views, everybody hates this. Event source, database tables, materialized views, People do not like the fact that you're pulling data off of CAF topic, storing it in your new database, and then triggering a recalc. It feels redundant. On the other hand, because of the fact that you only store what you need, only the rows, only the columns, and you can wipe it out whenever you feel like it, it actually ends up saving data based on the old data way we were doing it in the old data teams. Inaccessible databases. Get your metadata management working right. Because if you can't get to the databases to figure out what's in there, you need to know from the metadata what's happening. And new computing patterns, oh dear, race conditions other nice things pitch up. Uh, there's lots of funnies that are going to pitch up. What comes first? What happens? So you're really going to understand your business before you tackle this. So who is event-driven microservices for? If you're in a complex environment and there's lots of weird heterogeneous processes running around and it's difficult to understand where the data is coming from, if, you, if data is very important in your world, like in a financial services world, and if you already have well-defined binary context, this is going to be a very good pattern for you to use. Um, I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions?
Hi. Um, looking at your tech stack with uh, C Sharp and SQL Server, and yeah. you mentioned Active Directory, mm. I'm wondering why you went for Kafka instead of the message broker on SQL Server. Uh, we already had the Kafka tech stack in the environment. So we had uh, the Hortonworks cluster, and we were already actually using Kafka to get, so there's a history behind it. Um, we have Sitecore database, so there's actually a long history. So we have Sitecore as our digital uh, platform, and we had Mongo databases sitting inside there to do analytics for Sitecore. And we were struggling to get the data out in a, in a nice, easy way. So then we found a tool, CDC, and at that time, we were like, yay, CDC, it's awesome. Uh, we learned lessons after that, but at the time, it was like, yay, CDC. So we used CDC to get data out of Mongo into Kafka and from Kafka into other databases. So Kafka was so easy to work with, and we loved it so much, and it was so kind of, it was really part of our comfort zone, and we could figure out really good ways of working with it, and then we could find nice libraries that could integrate with C Sharp eventually over time. So it kind of just grew into it, so that was a one thing, it was already there, and we were accustomed to using it. And two, getting new tooling into any organization can be, yeah, getting people to approve new tooling, especially in a financial services environment, can be a bit of a mission. So if you've got something that works, don't ask any questions, just, just use it and get, get the job done, you know. Cool. Any other hands? Uh, No, I just stand and manage. <laughs> it's an important function, apparently. Right at the back. So I understand you uh, are a window shop and you've decided to put C sharp into containers. I just wanted to ask, have you ever heard of Stockholm Syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I was actually expecting another question. Look, I would love to get into containerization. I th I'm hearing containerization. Um, we just haven't got there. It's like we will get there eventually, but it's, it's taking some time. We, we, we do have a lot of regulatory and compliance processes. If we ever want to change our tech stack, it's, I think we've been on a journey now to change our tech stack to get a particular component that's to do with digital marketing. I think we spent now a year so far going to various compliance committees, and we still haven't got approval to use this particular piece of tooling. So when you know that a new piece of tooling is going to take you a year of committees, ooh, I mean, you should probably be more enthusiastic, but your, your, your wool shrinks and you think, oh, should I? So yeah, just change, changing technologies can be a bit of a, a problem sometimes in, in a heavily regulated environment. Sounds like the kind of answer from somebody with Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Have me. <laughs> That's fine. Any other questions? No. Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks.